Hello everyone, Dr. Chris Martinson here of Peak Prosperity here at Honey Badger Farm on a beautiful day. Listen, I've got this incredible interview with Dr. Pierre Corey who was just on the Joe Rogan Experience with Brett Weinstein. Incredible episode, watch that if you can. Just by happenstance, I happened to have interviewed Pierre Corey just a week ago. He's got some really incredible things to say. Come check it out, it's a great interview. Welcome to this Peak Personalities Podcast. I am your host, Dr. Chris Martinson. With every episode, you'll learn something, you'll become smarter, and you'll move ahead of the pack. Now, today's guest is Dr. Pierre Corey, certainly a huge personality and a leading champion of patient care along several lines, especially including treatment of COVID-19 and the use of high-dose intravenous vitamin C to radically improve outcomes for patients who present to an ICU with sepsis. We're going to be talking about COVID and Pierre's upfront and unfortunate personal experience with censorship. Dr. Corey is now famous, or perhaps infamous, for his tireless work with the Frontline COVID Critical Care Doctors, or FLCCC. Early in the pandemic's course in the U.S., he and other doctors came to the conclusion that effective early treatment was the answer to COVID. I'll tell you this, if I ever end up in an ICU, it's any of the FLCCC doctors that I want attending to me. Hands down, no question about it. They use their training, their minds, their experience, and most of all, their hearts to deliver the best possible care to their patients. I also consider him to be both a friend and a compatriot in the battles we're all facing to bring out the truth. Hey, welcome, Dr. Corey. Oh, Chris, that was a great intro, and uh, I'm really happy to to be here, really, uh, you're probably one of my favorite people to talk to. So thanks. <laughs> oh, thanks. That's, uh, you know, we met first in, um, and thanks. That's very kind of you to say, uh, you really are a, a legendary and, and just an amazing human being. And, um, I, I, I sing your praises all the time. And, uh, it wasn't until I met you though, when we met in person that I really got to get a sense of both you and Dr. Merrick, when we met down in, in Houston and got to meet Dr. Joe Verone as well. And I really, I came away so impressed with all of you. Uh, very quickly, how, how did the FLCCC come together? Who are these other people in your crew and, and, and what's your relationship? Yeah. So what's interesting is I, I wasn't that close. I didn't know them before we started. I mean, everything starts around Paul, right? So Paul, you know, he's, he's, uh, you know, a really uh, famous guy in our specialty. You know, he's the the most published practicing intensivist in the world, right? So uh, the, the guys had a huge imprint on the specialty. And, and I became friends with him a couple of years ago around a shared interest in sepsis interventions. And I started doing research, which kind of overlapped his and and he and I just hit it off and we became good friends and we, we, we talked all the time. And so what happened with the FLCCC is when COVID was coming to our shores, right? And, and, I, and I could still remember this like yesterday, Chris, you know, when, when Lombardy was getting hit and Seattle was getting hit and New York was starting to get hit and it was, it was literally like out of a horror movie, the stuff that you were seeing. And as an ICU doc, seeing like ICUs overfilling, the biohazard suits, and everybody was scared. Doctors were going down. Nurses were going down, right? It, I mean, I, I think we might forget how how just horrible that was. And and people came to Paul and said, hey, you got to figure out how to treat this thing. You got to put together a protocol. And they kind of nudged him to get a group together and work on a protocol. And, and that's what we did. I mean, Paul was really our leader intellectually. You know, he's already had protocols that he built around sepsis. And we all five have just kind of refined them and developed them. And, and I would say, you know how like you have computing, uh, you know, supercomputers and you kind of like split them up into a network. It's like we kind of split our brains into five and we just did a lot of reading. And so uh, we shared a lot of knowledge, a lot of papers and and a lot of insights at the bedside. And and also we use something called, Chris, you might appreciate this. Uh, it's called the telephone. We actually like called doctors like mm -hmm. in Italy and Seattle and New York, like the, I was on the phone every day with ICU docs in New York, trying to figure out like, what are you trying? What are you seeing? What are you doing? And like, we were figuring out stuff like that just by using something called the telephone. So anyway, long answer, Chris, but that's how we started. And that's what we were doing. Well, you know, uh, in, in my own case, you know, people ask like, how did I get so much right about COVID so early? I tell them I have a Comcast connection. <laughs> 
and and I had free time, which I know doctors often don't have, right? So true. So I had a lot of free time to research this, but I'm I'm curious. So take us through your first COVID patient to how long it took before you realized what you were actually looking at in terms of what this disease actually was. I'm thinking of organizing pneumonia here. What when, yeah. when how long before that insight came up? Oh, so that's really that's good. That's a great question. So um, when I, when it, so the thing about organizing, so, so when I first saw my first few patients, I was in uh, university of Wisconsin, where I was the chief of the critical care service. And I had spent oh, six weeks preparing all of the operations, the units, we, we were rewriting processes and just doing all of these things before our first patient hit the unit. So it was this really weird, you know, it's funny, you're making me think about that time. It was like this, this weird, like prelude, like we were waiting, waiting, waiting for those patients to hit, but you could see them hitting everywhere else. Like, again, I knew what was happening in New York and I couldn't believe the stories I was hearing. But then when they hit uh, Wisconsin, we didn't get, you know, remember those, remember we talked about the surges and flattening the curves and so Mm -hmm. you don't get overwhelmed. Well, you know, in the middle of the country, we never got like that big crest of a wave that crashed on us, right? It, It came, in, you know, kind of slow and steady. So we were never really unmanageable, at least last spring. Um, And so the first few that came in as the chief of the critical care service, they wanted me in like, I don't want to overuse military uh, uh, analogies, but they wanted me like in the rear guard, right? They didn't want me on the front lines. They wanted me because they wanted critical care leadership and expertise. They didn't want me to get sick. Right. And so, um, but I couldn't help it. As soon as like those first patients came in, like I'm also an expert at uh, what's called point of care ultrasound. And so for imaging these patients, they weren't allowed to go to CAT scans. You know, they, they were very limited and none of the cardiology sonography techs were allowed to go in the rooms. Like it was bizarre. So voila, I said, I got to go help out the fellas. <laughs> and, and, and so I went, you know, I went in the, uh, I went on the, on the wards and, and I was doing lots of scans. I was discussing with uh, my colleagues and we figured out a couple of things really quick. I mean, first of all, they were hyper inflamed. Number one, number two, uh, we could see the clotting. We were doing special, specialized clottings to test. And we saw these incredibly hypercoagulable profiles. Like it was like a slam dunk. These patients needed to be uh, anticoagulated. Um, and then the organizing pneumonia thing that happened after I left Wisconsin and went to New York. So just I'll fast forward a little bit. You know, we figured out a few things really early. And I got to tell you, I cheated because by the time I saw my first patient, I knew that in New York, right? Remember when we talked about ventilators running out? Mm -hmm. The reason why ventilators were running out was really simple is because when you don't treat someone, they don't get better. Like medicines actually work. And when you offer them no medicine, right? And at that time, the entire world, or I should say the leaders were saying supportive care only, right? Which is Tylenol fluids, a ventilator if you can't breathe anymore, some oxygen. Those aren't treatments, right? Those just support, you know, symptom relief. So you could tell that the supportive care only wasn't working. And I started to hear that finally docs felt like they had to do something. When they started using steroids, interestingly, you first saw the first most compelling reports was from social media. You had these docs anonymously saying, hey, you know, I remember there was this one post from Michigan, a guy in Detroit, because remember, Detroit was another just horror show. And he, this guy put out some stuff on Facebook, said, listen, we were struggling. Nobody's getting off the ventilators. Everyone's crashing on the ventilators. We started using steroids and people are getting discharged. We're getting more vents. And so like I started hearing reports on that. And so that was even before my first patient, I was hearing that. And so um, we kind of knew they needed steroids, anticoagulation. And then some of the other stuff in our protocol, we just know it applies to all of critical illness. And so we started using those. Um, But it was really, uh, you know, when I went to New York, what happened in Wisconsin was my leaders refused. They did not want to hear from me anymore. So I was really pushing for anticoagulation. I kept mentioning that these patients needed steroids. And there was a real uh, conflict between the leaders of the institution, you know, clinical leaders above me. uh, They thought that was insane, that to do that without a randomized controlled trial, um, I was going to harm these patients. And when I was pointing out that they're mortality rates 
using supportive care only were so blatantly, absurdly high, unconscionable, unacceptable, unprecedented. And, and they were, they, you know, it's almost like, uh, I'm trying to think, it, nothing's funny here, Chris, but like, you know, stay the course. Right? Like, like, uh, hey, 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 captain, there's like an iceberg. Ahead. Like, stay the course. <laughs> and so um, I said, I wrote, a, I wrote an email saying, you know, I, I can't in good conscience be your chief of critical care if, if this, if you're mandating following these guidelines, because the guidelines were all saying supportive care only. And, and so I asked for, I called it a humanitarian leave. I said, I want to go to New York because at that time, in all of us ICU specialist inboxes, there were these really gripping emails from all of our professional societies, like literally saying intensivists needed in New York now. And I'm a New Yorker. You know that, Chris? Mm -hmm. I was born, raised, trained there. All of my buddies were fighting there. And I'm like, I just wanted to go to New York. Like they, they weren't letting me treat the patients in Wisconsin. And so I went to New York. Anyway, are these long answers, Chris? Because I, you're, you're getting me like all emotional, man, remembering what it was like last year. <laughs> well, maybe that's part of the interview style. I don't know. Yeah, so, <laughs> maybe you're doing this on purpose. You're <laughs> always ahead of the game. <laughs> <laughs> what I'm, what I really want to get at though is, is you mentioned that there were these, um, when you're butting heads with the leadership, they're saying, "Here's this protocol we want to follow." Whose protocol was that? Oh yes. <laughs> All right, I, I got to try to be professional here. So for me, one of the historically most absurd documents, in fact, that when it came out and I opened it, I literally like my jaw dropped. So it was from, oh my gosh, I'm not going to win friends when I say this. Um, but it came out of the American Thoracic Society. Okay, so in my specialty, which is Many of us in the country, the lung specialists generally tend to be ICU specialists. So we're, we're called pulmonary critical care specialists. We're dual boarded. And we really have um, three main societies. You have the Society of Critical Care Medicine. You have the American Thoracic Society. And you have the American College of Chest Physicians. The ATS is sort of considered like the ivory tower of the three. Like that's for like the scientist physicians with the grants and the research that are in all the academic medical centers. The American College of Chest Physicians is more for like the clinician educators, like the infantrymen, you know, the guys on the front line who are trying to figure out how to treat patients. And then SCCM is kind of a mix of both. Anyway, the ATS put out a document, which was this quasi guideline, but it was basically it was where they got a hundred experts in a room and they asked them, what do you think about corticosteroids? What do you think about anticoagulation? What do you think about ventilator strategy? And basically every survey was like 40% said yes, 40% said no. And like 10% were undecided or whatever that was. Like it was like, there was no conclusive opinion. So basically every one of these metrics was the following we have no recommendation on this or like we have no opinion on this. So it was basically a guideline of no opinion. Like you could have made a skit out of this or a farce or, or a, a horrible comedy. It was like tragic comic. I was like, wait a second. The guideline says we don't have an opinion on anything. The only thing they didn't have, an, they had an opinion on Chris was thou shalt not use corticosteroids. That was the only nice. thing that the hundred geniuses in the room could agree on was to not use steroids. But everything else was like, we officially cannot find a consensus on anything, which is fair because they didn't really know what to do. But you're telling me that the data was already coming in where you're starting to see observationally a big difference in survival. Wait, did you say observationally? Yes. That's a thing? <laughs> so in this, I'm imagining, so let, we're going to, we're going to, you know, it's going to really gall both of us in 10 years are going to write the retrospective movie on this whole thing. And there's going to be these daring plucky NIH staffers who against all odds managed to find the signals and surface them in the nick of time to save whole populations. Right. Cause that's what You're we want to see, see in the that movie. <laughs> <laughs> right. It's like the movie contagion, right? You have these really sharp plucky people who see things and piece it all together what you're describing is not really a heroic Hollywood sort of adventure. This sounds like the opposite. This would be like one of those films with subtitles we don't like watching. We're like trenches, you know, like I, I don't want to overuse military because I, I, you know, 
Although at the time, I got to tell you, there was a lot of fear I and mean, we had fear for our, our own health and livelihoods. Yep. That's for sure. Um, but, um, but yeah, no, I totally get it. But this is just, we're trying to figure this out, you know, like, like I said, when you start from the fact that no treatment was literally cratering critical care systems across the world, that's what I was saying back in March. I'm like, I am seeing critical care systems collapse. They're running out of ICU rooms. They're running out of ventilators. Like it, it didn't take, I mean, to conclude that we got to throw something at this horrific hyperclotting, hyperinflammatory disease. I mean, it wasn't a stretch. I didn't think so. Well, so when did you actually decide yourself that corticosteroids worked and, and, and when did you go in front of the U S Senate to say that? So I will say that the first person, so it, it was sort of the, the three signals that I got were happening simultaneously. So one is we have to give credit to Umberto Maduri. So he's one of the FLCCC, right? So when, when Paul brought the, the core five of us together, uh, I was honored to be one of them because I'm a good friend and colleague with Paul. And uh, again, we've done a lot of uh, uh, research on sepsis together. Um, but Umberto Maduri is, is the world expert on corticosteroids and lung disease. And he had published a paper at like late April, which went out to the entire Society of Critical Care Medicine membership, which basically they reviewed all of the data from SARS and MERS and H1N1. And all of that was observational data, observational control trials, and they had a lot of confounders, but he did a very careful analysis of all the data from the prior pandemics. And there, his group found that corticosteroids were absolutely life-saving in those prior coronavirus and influenza pandemics. And so it basically was against orthodoxy, right? It was like, actually, steroids aren't harmful their life savings. So one is we knew the data from the prior pandemics. The other is, like I said, I knew it on the ground. I was getting too many people telling me on the ground that before steroids, no good. After steroids, good. You, you know, like, <laughs> like things were better. Patients were doing better. And so, um, and then the organizing pneumonia thing, <clears throat> I'm trying to think, yeah, I had already started writing that paper before my testimony. And, and what happened with organizing pneumonia, which is kind of a cool story, is that time period, there's a lot of people in medicine who are talking about happy hypoxemia. You remember that, mm -hmm. that phrase? And because for a lot of physicians and lung specialists, usually when you see people with low oxygen levels, especially severely low oxygen level, where they need very high fractions of oxygen, they're usually really working hard to breathe. And they're usually in distress where you actually have to put them on a mechanical ventilator. But in, in COVID, what you saw was patients requiring really high amounts of oxygen to support them, but they looked reasonably comfortable. Mm -hmm. And they were just kind of breathing gently, a little fast, but not, not working hard. And we, we kind of know some of the reasons why is that they didn't have wet lungs. They had inflamed dry lungs. And mm -hmm. most of the bacterial infections that cause ARDS, that's a wet lung and it's a heavy lung. And so when your lungs are like, when you're kind of drowning from an illness, it's very difficult to breathe. But, but the dry lung of COVID was mystifying everyone. And I kept seeing these patients and I'm like, you know, they look so good and they're on so much oxygen. And then one day, like it was literally like at bedtime, I think, or in the morning, I think I was in the shower, actually. You remember the morning, morning brain, uh -huh. morning brain works well. And so I suddenly clicked. I said, you know, these patients remind me of my patients with organizing pneumonia. And, you know, I won't go too far into organizing pneumonia, but organizing pneumonia is an inflammatory reaction to something. It's not an infectious pneumonia although it can be associated with infections, it can happen after an infection. It usually happens around cancer drugs. And I've done a lot of lung cancer work and I've gotten referred a lot of patients because there's a lot of new chemotherapy and like oral, we call them ibs and abs, you know, like persitinib and persitinab and all these new cancer drugs. And many of them cause organized pneumonia. And the clinical presentation of patients with cancer and organized pneumonia is exactly that. They have they oftentimes require lots of oxygen, but they look really comfortable and they take forever to get better. They take weeks. And so I was like, that's why these patients are A, taking forever and B, they tolerate it pretty well. And so, so I'll finish my story by saying this is that as soon as it clicked, 
I happen to be uh, close friends and colleagues with really one of the top chest radiologists in the country. He's actually at University of Wisconsin. And I called him up. His name is Jeff Caney. And I said, I called him up with Jeff and I said, Jeff, I got to bounce something off you. I said, what would you say if I told you that everyone with COVID has organizing pneumonia? And you know what he says to me? He says, he says, yeah, no kidding. We wrote that in our position paper in March. Like this is probably late April when I called him up. And I said, what are you talking about? You wrote it. He said, he said, yeah, in, in the journal radiology, top journal in radiology, expert panel was convened, right? This is an appropriate response for a country, right? You see this disease coming. They reviewed all the CAT scans out of Wuhan and they wrote a paper, published it in March in radiology. And in that position paper, they said the predominant form of lung injury is organizing pneumonia. And for your readers or listeners, corticosteroids are the mainstay of treatment for organized pneumonia. So when he said that to me, I said, I said, Jeff, wait, you're telling me you wrote that in a paper in the journal radiology in March? And he said, yeah. I said, you realize that no one read that paper? He said, I don't know. We read it. We wrote it. And I said, yeah, nobody got the memo. None of the clinicians got the memo. And I said, this is a major problem because no one's treating it with steroids. And he was like, why not? <laughs> he, again, he's a radiologist. He didn't understand. He's like, he's like, we wrote it. We wrote it in March. So anyway, Chris, you get me talk a lot of, a lot of medicine stuff, but uh, I think this is exciting historically. And so at the end of that conversation, I said, Jeff, we got to write a paper and we got to publish it in a clinical journal. We got to let the world know that this is really a pandemic of organizing pneumonia and it needs steroids. Um, and I got my first rejection from a journal within two weeks. And then it took me six journals and until about September to publish. Um, but it's it's a well-regarded paper. So this is actually the story I want to get to is, is the difficulty of getting new information into the medical system, which is, which is sort of well-known. Of course, we've heard the apocryphal stories about, you know, once something finally is proven to be workable, it takes 10 or more years to sort of penetrate sometimes into, into the world of, of medical treatments. But, but there's another sort of story here. And, and when we were in Houston, you told me a story that I think, I love these fractal representations. It gives me something I can get my hands around that helps me understand the larger. Because we're describing something, I could hear people listening in my mind. They're going, well, Chris and Pierre, you know, that was a fog of war, to use the war metaphor. It was, it was yep. you know, a lot of uncertainty. Nobody knew what was going on. I have a judgment that maybe all Some did. Built, some knew. Have, some, some people knew, but I'm thinking, you know, you needed a Comcast connection for starters and a telephone. You needed these among these many devices, but and or maybe a multi-billion dollar budget with people who have the time and the resources to actually do these things, like find these things and communicate them. But I'll leave that aside. But you told me a story that has changed me, and it was around vitamin C. So I yeah. gotta tell you, I kind of before COVID, I think I had ingested some of the um, marketing, I don't know what else to call it, or propaganda, which basically my doctor had convinced me that buying vitamins was an expensive way to take a leak. Yep. That's all. Like, oh, you can take them, but you'll just piss them out. So then you told me the story about vitamin C, and you told me things I didn't know about it, about, about the mammals that can and can't make it. So can you take us through that story of vitamin C? Because I think contained in that story is the COVID story itself. Well, that's interesting, because... Um... It's funny, if we ever get past COVID, I, I want the FLCC second chapter to be vitamin C. But yeah, so what? What? here's what we learn about vitamin C. So let's start off with what your doctor told you, because what your doctor told you is true. And, and I like a phrase that Paul recently shared with me is that one of his old pharmacology professors told him that people who can afford vitamins do not need vitamins. <laughs> There's no such thing. Everybody in this country, you know, with like their, their medicine cabinets full of vitamins, it's total nonsense. I mean, people who can afford vitamins don't need vitamins. It's really for the, the malnourished, right? The low and middle income around the world. That's yep. where vitamins, that's where malnu malnutrition and hypovitaminosis uh, happens. But, but aside from that, what we found out about vitamin C, and, and I'll try to distill it to like the, the key sort of foundational aspects of the therapy is that number one is that humans are almost unique amongst mammals in the terms of when they're critically stressed or infected, 
we cannot make vitamin C. That's why it's vitamin, right? So what defines vitamins is that you need to exogenously administer it. You can't make it yourself. So you have to take it in from outside. And every other mammal, with the exception of humans, fruit bats, and guinea pigs, those are the three, um, makes a ton of vitamin C in illness. So like a goat who's stressed can make 60 grams, which is a huge amount of vitamin C. All of the mammals can make vitamin C. They endogenously produce it, and it goes to very high levels when they're fighting an infection. Humans are not, and we're particularly susceptible to sepsis. So that's one thing is we can't make it. The second thing is, although grandma tells you to take, you know, everyone's always to tell you to take your vitamin C when you're sick. And it probably does have a little bit of benefit. Like, you know, we, we know from the trials, but I got to tell you, the benefits there from oral vitamin C, it's just not, I'm an, I'm an ICU doctor. I like big magnitude impacts. It's there. It's just not large. Mm -hmm. um, and you really would have to take a lot and probably take it regularly, like several times a day. And you could probably shorten the duration of illness and, uh, you know, from the common cold. But when, when you're an ICU level sick, Oral vitamin C is like, uh, you know, whatever, a drop in the, I mean, it's not going to do anything. It, there's, what happens is with vitamin C is not only do we need it from outside, but when you take it orally, there's what's called limits to its absorption in the intestine. You can't absorb large amounts very quickly. And then we also excrete it very quickly. And so to me, you just can't really fight an illness with oral vitamin C. But what was discovered is when you give patients IV, so it's very water soluble, and you administer it in veins, especially at regular intervals, let's say every six hours, you can maintain what are called supraphysiologic concentrations in the bloodstream while people are fighting infections. And you can basically mimic what all the other mammals are doing, which is really raising the concentration of vitamin C and maintaining. But you need an IV, you need an ICU, right? So that's the third thing. So the first is we can't make it. The second is we can't really absorb it orally. The third is you need to give it IV at high doses at regular intervals. But the fourth thing, and this is where the entire health system has gotten IV vitamin C wrong. And this is what I want to bring to the world's attention uh, as soon as we're done curing COVID, Chris. You know, just got a couple of things to take care of first. Mm -hmm. um, but we, what we discovered, and I, I'm really proud of my work in this area, is we discovered is that when you look at a patient, so our, our, our model where we studied the most is septic shock. And when you look at a septic shock patient from the time they enter the doors of the emergency room until they get admitted to the ICU, they're given antibiotics and fluids. Some of them land on ventilators. Some of them, their kidneys fail. And a whole bunch of things can happen in septic shock. And many die. It has a very high mortality, you know, in, in some you know, right, right around anywhere between 30 and 50% of patients with septic shock will die. And so I did a study looking at, um, I started using vitamin C really aggressively. And the reason why, and this is how me and Paul became good friends, is that Paul put out a paper showing this dramatic reduction in mortality in his ICU. And he published it. And the intelligentsia, the ivory towers went nuts because it was not a prospective randomized controlled trial. And they thought it was ludicrous that someone would publish the cure for sepsis without doing it randomized. And so there was a huge controversy around it. And I got to tell you, I didn't really know Paul at that time. And when I saw his paper, it was the definition of too good to be true. Mm -hmm. There was no way this paper could be true. There's no way you can give someone a vitamin and, and reduce mortality from 40% of patients down to 8% of patients. Wow. And so I kind of was like, I didn't understand it. I was like, I need more. I don't know what this is. And I, you know, it's too weird, came out of nowhere. And, and so I didn't use it. And then I was treating septic shock, treating septic shock, and my patients die at pretty high rates. And so I tried it on a patient once who was actually near death. And guess what, Chris? Unfortunately, they died. <laughs> you know, I did it like really, you know, in the throes of actively dying. And then I tried it on another, you know, it's called the Mara cocktail, which is a high dose of vitamin C and he pairs it with corticosteroids and thiamine. And then I tried it on another patient who was quite ill. And I kind of thought that I saw an improvement that I was a little bit unexpected. 
And then the, 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 the thing that happened to me is I used it on a patient who was a bone marrow transplant patient with no immune system. They had zero white cells detectable in the blood. And they came in with what's called gram negative sepsis. And that's what happens when you're getting a bone marrow transplant because they irradiate your marrow, they take away your immune system, right? And then they give you new cells. But in that period before you're engrafted, you're uniquely susceptible to dying from uh, bad infections. And this guy came crashing into my ICU. He had no kidney function. His, he was confused. He was breathing fast. He had no blood pressure. And I gave him the usual cocktail, but then I added the Marrick protocol. And what I saw next, I had never seen in my career. And I've, tr I've treated hundreds, if not thousands of these patients. I saw that by the evening, his, the amount of support that he was on had drastically decreased. And in the morning, I came into work. There was a bag full of urine, meaning his kidney function had totally returned. He was off vasopressors. He was eating breakfast, talking to his wife, clear of mind. And I didn't really know what to say. And I was like, whoa, that stuff really works. And then here's, here's the external validation. The bone marrow transplant attending who's been doing this for like 20 or 30 years came up to me. I was on round seeing other patients. He had seen the patient because it's his patient. And he came over me, said, Pierre, what did you do to that guy? And I was like, Mark, his name was Mark. I was like, Mark, um, you're not going to believe this, <laughs> but I gave him intravenous vitamin C. <laughs> and Mark was like, whatever. You know? <laughs> he, he didn't really think it was that, that crazy. But anyway, that's, that's my long and very uh, animated story of it. But, but after that point, let me finish on that point four. Is, is, and this is where the rest of medicine gets it wrong. Is What I learned after treating patients over a year and a half and collecting data, and when we started to look at the outcomes of patients who got vitamin C and who didn't, we noticed that the patient got vitamin C did much better. Mortality was better. Rates of kidney failure were better. But when I started to slice and dice the data, I remember I asked our data analyst one day, I said, can you separate the patients that came in through the emergency room between and those that get flown in? Because at the University of Wisconsin, we get patients from the community, but we also get about half of our patients are flown in from outlying areas, from regional small hospitals and ICUs. And they're oftentimes later phase in disease. And what I saw there was absolutely shocking is that in the group that came in through emergency room, they did phenomenal. In fact, all of the benefits were concentrated in that group. Anyone who came into us from a helicopter or ambulance from an outlying area, there was zero difference between those who got vitamin C and those who didn't. And so it didn't take long for me to figure out like, oh, early treatment matters, right? Because those that come in through the ED, you can start the IV and get the vitamin C into them uh, between hours. And then we started doing these really cool time analyses and unbelievable. If you gave it to them between six hours of hitting the doors of the ED, no one died. In fact, actually in my database now, which is 45 patients, I think, who got it within six hours, one death, um, but that was a patient who came from the wards and he was day 150 of his hospitalization. He was dying of a failed lung transplant. So he doesn't really count, but in, in the larger group, they do so well if you give it to them early. And so, so the thing I'm going to finish on is vitamin C to me, it's very physiologic. It it's, does an end, round, un, end run around an evolutionary mutation, which makes us particularly susceptible to sepsis. But its main role is in preventing organ failure. It's almost like Humpty Dumpty, right? It's preventing Humpty Dumpty from falling off the wall. Like once he falls off and breaks, it's not really going to work to put him back together. So it's, it's this incredibly physiologically pre, pre, uh, protective intervention. And Paul Marek knows it. I know it. And you should have heard my first phone call with Paul. Like I, I managed to email him and then we had a call and I was like, yeah, I couldn't stop talking about how, how my mind was blown about this therapy. Anyway, another long answer, Chris, this is either my fault or your fault. Uh, I'll, I'll take it. Um, how many years ago was that? Let's see. He published at the end of 2016. I first read his paper in 2017. I probably started using it early 2018. And that's probably when we had our conversation. So where are we now? We're in the middle of 2021. Mm -hmm. uh, so I would say two and a half years ago, I guess, or three and a half years ago. 
So, so out here as a, as a non-medical person, you know, one of the things I like to, my little fantasy is that when somebody figures out a way and tell me if I've, if I heard the story, right, finds a way to drop sepsis deaths from 40% to 8%, that that takes off like wildfire. Like people are beating down the door to figure out like what you got. You're being asked to present at conferences and within six months, that standard of care everywhere at every sepsis unit in America that's what I would like to imagine. What actually happened? Well, be, let's just say that so what you just described is really interesting because what is said in medicine is that the time, the average time between the first trial showing like a new therapy works or like has a profound impact on a disease to the time it, it, it shows up in guidelines is actually 17 years. It's not six months. Mm -hmm. It's 17 years because you have the Simmelweis reflex, right? So any, any bright doctor who comes up with a new idea and says, hey, I figured out a way to do this better, generally everyone's skeptical, right? So the, the, the degree of skepticism in medicine, like we don't just adopt things, right? No, no, so hold first, on. Yeah, who, who's Semmelweis for those of us listening who oh, he, don't know their medical history? He, this is true. Okay, so Semmelweis is the guy, the doctor who figured out that the, the rates of um, maternal uh, mortality, right, of dying of sepsis back in the 1800s in Vienna was due to the fact that the surgeons uh, or, or the obstetricians who were delivering were not washing their hands. And they were basically transmitting bacterial infections from mother to mother. They, they just didn't have good hand washing. And he noticed that in the hospital where a lot of the deliveries were done by medical students who were doing autopsies, where they washed their hands after the autopsies, the maternal mortality rates were much lower. And so he came up with this crazy idea, Chris, he didn't have a Comcast connection or a telephone, <laughs> but he, he did have powers of observation, which you're not allowed to use. And he said, hmm, maybe if we wash our hands, we could reduce the maternal mortality rates. And that's exactly what happened, right? And so that went down. But the, the, the reason why you bring up Simmelweis is because he was roundly criticized, uh, essentially shunned. Uh, he actually ended up dying of sepsis in, I think, a, in a prison. Um, I mean, this, he was not celebrated for his contributions, let's say that, um, except for the women he saved along the way before he was shunned out of the specialty. But um you know, and but that's been described throughout the history of medicine. Any any new advance is first. Uh, we've talked about it, Chris. And I think you're the one who taught me the the Schopenhauer quote, right? Right. I think I heard that from you. You told me. Uh, let's run through it again. Uh, what, what's the three stages of any any all, new? All discovery? truth passes through three stages, right? Yep. First, it's ignored, right? Then it's ridiculed or violently opposed, and then it's accepted as self evident. Exactly. That's exactly. And so, so with, with sepsis, it was ignored and kind of dismissed. Uh, then it was violently attacked, but here's the problem that happened with vitamin C is um, your, what you would have imagined had the randomized controlled trials of intravenous vitamin C, had they been positive, they would be the standard of care worldwide right now. The tragedy in medicine and why people are dying, in my opinion, of bacterial sepsis at still unacceptably high rates is because every single, with the exception of one, which kind of got it quick, but not really, every single major randomized controlled trial delivered the therapy on average anywhere between 14 and 22 hours from admission to the emergency room. My data shows that there's no benefit that far into septic shock. You got to give it in six hours, and none of them did that. There was one that started it early, but only gave it twice a day and stopped after four doses. And so, and they didn't show a benefit. So no one has, has ever recreated what Paul did, which is Paul gave it to them early. He gave it to them generally in the emergency room um, or right upon admission to the ICU. And, you know, luckily, there is a group in Belgium, at least right before COVID, they were about to start a major trial starting in the emergency room. And it's my belief and Paul's belief that he will finally be validated when they complete that trial, because it's clear that it works. I know it works. I have zero doubt that trial will be positive. Uh, 
unless they screw it up in some other important way. But uh, I think they get what they need to test, which is early treatment and you continue it until they get better. And so um, that's sort of the fifth point is that, you know, if, if anyone listens to me and they say, oh, well, one makes sense, two makes sense, three makes sense. Yeah, oral, you need IV, you need to give it early. But then if they go and they look up these trials and they see that they all show that vitamin C doesn't work and you got to understand the entire ivory tower. Do you know how, how this is sick though, how happy they were to Mm -hmm. say that Paul Merrick lost his way or he got this wrong. Like we did, you know, the gold standard investigation to prove a therapy is efficacious, the randomized control trial. And they definitively say that this has no value in sepsis. Yay. So, you know, after hearing this story, I had to go look it up. So, so I was like, well, maybe this is too good to be true. I, I like to do my research. So I looked it up and I found this Ali Citrus trial, right? Yeah. And I'm looking at it and they say right up front in the abstract, we tracked 46 biomarkers and 43 of them were terrible. And this is the one I did that, that YouTube around where I had to go all the way through. I had to read through the whole paper. There were like 43 biomarkers were, were bad. Nothing happened. Therefore, we conclude vitamin C doesn't work. But there were three biomarkers that actually did work a little bit. Those were lowered mortality, less time in the ICU, and a faster discharge. But beyond that, Chris, this stuff did. Are are you trying to say that's important? (laughs) That's not that. What about the ferritin? What about the procalcitonin? What about the the white count? That's way more important than surviving. Talk about burying the lead. Like, I'm like, yes, I want all three of those things. If that's me or my dad or somebody, right? You know, and it's just, uh, but you could feel the bias coming through. And so, so my point in this is very instructive. So here's what you found in vitamin C. The story was this stuff works. You have to give it early. And you have to follow, there's a certain way the protocol works and other ways the protocol doesn't work. Is yep. this not the exact same story with COVID where maybe they don't, maybe people are designing, I think the UK recovery trial was designed to fail yes. in certain respects. They designed it to fail. What a cliffhanger, I know, right? So sorry to leave you hanging like that, but here's the deal. I just had a long form interview with Dr. Vanden Bosch, taken down, censored, deleted, by Vimeo, which is a pay for play. They, we pay them to host our videos and still they censored us because they didn't like the content of that video for some reason. So here's the deal. I can't put things out here in public anymore like I used to. I want to, but I can't. So if you want to see the rest of this interview with Dr. Pierre Corey, it's really amazing. Love this guy. Just follow this link right here and that'll get you over to how you can get to see that second part of the video. By the way, we do this all the time at my website at Peak Prosperity. We have amazing conversations, but increasingly out of public view because things are nutty with regards to censorship and uh, the overall tone of being shouted down by whatever's going on. Anyway, hope you enjoyed this. Sorry to have cut it off like this. We'll see you next time. And by the way, you can just come and follow us at any of these links that you see showing up here on this here cards. Take a screenshot of that, follow us wherever you can. We'll see you next time. Bye everyone.